Amen. Well, that's our prayer today, that we would learn to trust Him more and more. Well, uh, I'm so thankful uh, for each of you. I'm thankful to be part of this church, this body of believers. I had an old uh, saint friend in our church in Minnesota. His name was Bill Oakleaf, and and uh, he was just one of those passionate followers of Jesus. But he would get a twinkle in his eye, and he would say, you know, when I came to met, know Jesus, it was the best thing I ever experienced was knowing Christ. But then he would have that twinkle in his eye, and he would say, but you know what else I didn't know when I received Jesus? That I'd get to serve God with the best people. <laughs> and, he, and I just remember that, and I, I feel that way. I feel that way about you guys uh, so thankful for Nita and Laura. You know, if, if last year I was out in the lobby and there was a, a woman out there who I met and she was a, a missionary and she wasn't from the Black Hills. She was just traveling through and, uh, and she didn't know that we had any involvement with these retreats, but she said, you know, uh, it was a Thrive retreat that r God used to rescue not only my faith, but my ministry and uh, she shared how God pulled her out of a deep hole and restored her joy and her love. And so, uh, so thankful for, for Nita and, and, and uh, Laura and their ministry and how God works through his people. Well, the next uh, three weeks, we're going to take a little pause from our kind of our normal sermon series. We wrapped up Deuteronomy. Uh, this summer, we're going to jump into a series looking at the patriarchs of our faith, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, and matriarchs, women like Sarah and Rebecca, and how God helped us uh, understand faith through these lives, through these real people who really lived and wrestled with God and, and learned about what does faith mean. And so over the summer, we're going to be examining faith and what does faith look like and what does it mean for our lives. Uh, much of the New Testament goes back to the patriarchs and says, look, these were men and women of faith. Now, were they perfect? No, far from perfect. But we see it all, warts and all, but we see their trust, like we just sang this morning. We see their trust and their confidence in God. Um, this morning and the next two Sundays, we're really going to just pause and reflect on who we are as a church. Um, on your bulletin, on the front page, it has our, our mission, our vision, and it has our values. And so this morning, I'm going to be talking a little bit about a couple of our values as a church. You know, our values are, are so important because they, they come from our worship, right? They come from who we are as people. And, and then what we do is evidenced by our values. So, you know, I heard someone say, like, if you want to learn someone's values, just go back and see what they did with their time and their money over a course of time, and then you can clearly see what they value, <laughs> right? And so what we give ourselves to reflects our values. Now, I've, I've gotten to know many of you and heard your stories and heard how God has used Rimrock Church in your lives, and one of the values there is grace. And many of you have stories of maybe being in churches or families or systems, religious systems, where there wasn't a lot of grace, and you've experienced grace here at Rimrock Church. And I, and I rejoice with you in that. I rejoice that that's one of our values, that grace is such a, a powerful Thing. In fact, C.S. Lewis said uh, the only differentiation between Christianity and other, I mean, there's other, but what he said was the differentiating value was grace. That because of Jesus came in grace, you don't see that in any other religion. You don't see that in other thought processes in the world. That is unique, something that God revealed to us in Jesus Christ. The other value that you see there, uh, all those values are important, and I could easily do a sermon on all of them. All of them are equally important in their ways. But what I want to focus on today is the value of truth. Now, one of the things that um, we learn about Jesus, that the Gospels say about Jesus, that he came full of grace and truth. Now, I think that's beautiful and powerful <laughs> and so needed. Now, now we've been in... Uh, places or systems where maybe the value of grace is fully embraced but not truth and we've been in places or we've seen where the value of truth is fully embraced but not grace and both of those by themselves can lead you far from God and far from life in fact they could lead you to very dark places but what Jesus came to do 
is to bring those together in the fullness of who God is. Jesus was full of grace and truth. And so that tells us that God is a God of grace and truth. And both of these things must be held together to truly experience the life of God and what he intended for us. So I want to talk about truth a little bit. Uh, the, the other uh, day I was... Uh, uh, and the, I was home, and my son, my youngest son, was reading a book, and he said, Dad, Dad, I got a question. And I, and I love the enthusiasm, the curiosity of kids, and he was telling me the story of what uh, was in this book, but there was a picture there of some watermelons. And, uh, and, uh, and he said, Dad, these watermelons are square. <laughs> He's like, how does that happen? <laughs> I think I have a picture. Okay. And there's a heart-shaped one there, too. And he has wide eyes, and he's like, Dad, this was mind-blowing to him. He's like, how does this happen? And I said, son, these watermelons were grown with a form. There's a box, and they put the watermelon in the box. As it grows, it grows to the form that it's put in. And uh, that was mind-blowing to him, but... Um, I think about that, and I think about that as a picture of what God wants to do in us. You know, we are all being formed by something. Now, this is intrinsic to how God created the world. Um, sometimes we have this mistaken idea that uh, the nature should be wild. But as Christians, we don't believe that. In Genesis... It told us that God created a garden. He created the earth. But remember, the earth was formless and void. And then what did God do? He brought order. He brought a form to bring order into creation so that it would flourish and it would function according to its design. And that is true not only in all of creation of God did, but in the garden, he placed Adam and Eve in the garden. What did he tell them to do? Work in the garden care for it, and he said, subdue it, manage it. <laughs> so there's this mistaken idea, and by the way, this is a, an idea that's deeply rooted in our culture, but it is an anti-God, anti-Christ idea that somehow things are to be left alone and that they flourish wild, and that is not true. That is not how God created the world, creation, or us. We are to be formed, and this is true in all things, not just human life, but all things. I'm a gardener, and I love growing things and um, caring for things, but if I didn't have a fence around my garden, and if I did not care for my squash or my watermelons, they would be destroyed, they'd be eaten by the deer, <laughs> or they would grow wild and unformed. And so it is very important that I manage, I care for the garden so that it can produce fruit that can be enjoyed. And so the form is so important. Now we know this in our own bodies. So uh, many of you exercise, you go for walks, you go for runs, you lift weights. Now we know we need to do that, right? Because our bodies need to be shaped. They need to be formed. They need to be worked, the muscles. And we know the alternative. If you don't do that, um, if you just don't exercise or you don't do anything, what happens? You also take a form, the form of a couch, right? <laughs> like, you will be formed by something, right? So this is how God has created the world. This is how he's created us. We function in forms. We know this in the body, physical discipline, exercise. We know this in the mind, we must discipline our minds. This is why we believe in education is so important. If we take our young people and we just say, be free, be wild, you don't need to go to school, you don't need to do anything, what would happen? We, we know what would happen. It would be destructive. It would be crazy. It would be destructive to life and the formation that God intended. So we must discipline our minds and we must be disciplined in our spirits. There's spiritual disciplines. We must be formed as people in every way. And as Christians, we believe that we are being formed in Christ, that Jesus came for a purpose to reveal who God was. And this is his calling that we become his followers, that we be formed and shaped by him. And this is what Paul talks about in the New Testament, that we are in Christ. 
And then in him we take the shape and the form that he designed us to be. And so as the people of God, as the church, we are to be formed by the gospel. Now, the beautiful thing about the gospel is it's a message of truth and it's a message of grace. Is it not? And it invites us to relationship with God. Did you notice there's three value, Rimrock values <laughs> that I just talked about in the gospel? And so this idea of the truth is essential to our formation as a people, as individuals, but as a people, as the church, as the people of God. And this is why Jesus came. He said, he said I came to be the truth. This is what he said. He said, I am the truth. I'm the way. I'm the life. And here's what Jesus told us, that the devil's been lying to us since the garden, is that somehow the truth will somehow enslave us. But what did Jesus say? Did he say it would enslave us? He said, no, it will set you free. It will set you free. You see, the devil is a liar. And he says, if we are formed by the truth, then somehow then we can really live, but it's just the opposite. It's when we are formed by the truth that we can really live, <laughs> that we can be free. So I see a couple dangers that I want to talk about, and then we're going to look at God's solution to help us be formed by the truth. So there's two internal dangers. There's two internal dangers. I'm talking about the church, within the church, within our fellowship, within our worship, and within our gathering, within our relationships as the people of God. One danger I see concerning the truth is that we can confuse what are primary truths and what are secondary truths. And what do I mean by that? That God has revealed some things to us clearly, um, that even a child can understand, that all people can understand. So God is not hidden. He has revealed himself, and he's revealed primary things that are absolutely clear. And these are the essentials of the gospel. These are the essentials of who God is and, and who he is and what he's called us to be as his people. And the Bible spells these out clearly. There's no confusion. But then there's secondary things that God has left mysterious, that he hasn't revealed to us completely. I'll give you an example. One of the issues we all wrestled with, and we wrestle with it in the Bible, we wrestle in our faith, but by the way, people outside of the faith also wrestle with this because God has put this mystery in the very created order of things, is the tension between human agency, free will, and determinism or what God has willed, God's sovereignty, his control over all things. Now, at one time in your life, all of you have wrestled with that. Maybe some of you today are wrestling with that. And you know what? I think God wants us to wrestle with that because he's left that mysterious, that tension between human agency, human responsibility, which the Bible clearly teaches that we have a choice, that we have to respond, that what we do matters. But the Bible also clearly says that God is sovereign and that he knows all things, that he knows the past, the present, and the future, and he is over all things and above all things, and he's outside of time and space. And so how do we reconcile that? Well, the Bible leaves that tension in place. And this is, I think, one thing that tells me that the Bible is true is because it matches reality. So even secular materialists, as they look at the world around them, they see that tension. And you know what? There's secular materialists who are free will, and there's secular materialists who are determinists. You see, they, they have the same tension because it's intrinsic in how God made things. And it's mysterious, and we can't understand it. It's mind-blowing. It's beyond our understanding. And so I would say that is a secondary issue that we can't... Uh, define as a primary truth. And we've seen what happens. Did you know Denmark fought a war over that issue? They actually killed people. <laughs> the, the sovereign people were fighting the free will people and they actually took up swords. You see, we miss something when we fight over secondary things. There's a long list of secondary things, but there's a danger that we confuse those things. The early church in Acts 
as they, as they wrestled with the gospel and they wrestled who we are as the church, and you can read this in Acts 15, they had a council and they said, God, what are, the, what are the essential truths? What are the truths that we are to be formed at? What are the things that we're to hold no matter what? And what are the things that we can let go of, that we can allow for freedom and different opinions and different understanding? And it was a, it was a key moment in the church because they went to the gospel and they said, what is the truth? And they said, this is what God has shown us. And we will hold to these things. But these other things, there's freedom. God, there's mystery. It's okay. There's going to be difference of opinion. And the church was able to grow and cross cultures and cross languages and spread around the world. There's a danger, brothers and sisters. We must hold to essential truths, but we must hold loosely secondary things. The second danger I see internally is the aesthetics. The aesthetics. What do I mean by it? The way things appear or the way things make us feel. Now, now this is a very powerful thing. This is a good thing. But remember in the garden that uh, Eve saw the fruit and she saw it looked good and she desired it. So we got to be very careful when we're talking about truth and essential doctrine, essential truths of the gospel, that we don't confuse aesthetics with the reality of God's truth. Now, I see this as a danger in the church in America. As I was growing up in the 80s, there was a church growth movement, there was a seeker-sensitive movement, and churches became very concerned about how things looked, appeared, and how they felt. And brothers and sisters, I think this was a great, grave danger that has gripped the church in America, because the way things appear and the way things feel are not a solid foundation to build your faith. In fact, Jesus said, it's like a man building on the sand, right? The storm comes, the house is going to blow down. We say, what's happening in America? Why is the church falling apart? Well, are we being formed by aesthetics? Like, as a pastor, I I wrestle with this as people try different churches, but a lot of times they're choosing churches, they're attracted to churches based on the way things appear, the way things feel. And, and I'm, that's not all bad. It's like there's a place for that. It has its place. But we must be careful that we're not formed by those things because those things come and go. Those things change. And our feelings and our desires, and the way things look, we can be deceived. Eve was deceived. Adam was deceived. We must be careful. Jesus said, be careful about the way things appear while religious people present themselves. Be careful about the appearance of things because there's a, there's a core substance, there's a core truth that's way more important than the way things appear. So those are internal dangers. There's an external danger that's a, a, a way of thinking that I think is rooted in the lie of Satan in the garden, but this has permeated American culture. Brothers and sisters, as we look around us, we see what's happening on college campuses. We see what's happening to our own kids. I can't tell you how many families have said our kids are leaving the faith. Our kids are, are wandering. They're trying all these things. There's a thought process. There's a philosophy that I think Carl Truman, uh, who's prophetically stood in our generation and said, be careful, because there's a thought process. He calls it expressive individualism. And he said this comes from the thinking of Rousseau. He was a philosopher in the 1700s but it's bearing fruits. And the basic philosophy, the basic idea is that truth is a prison and we must break through out of it and we must become wild like nature. And so where does this show up? This showed up in the sexual revolution. So Carl Truman says, where did the sexual revolution came? It came from people saying, we don't like God's form of one man, one woman in marriage for a lifetime. We don't like that. We're going to break free from that. And what began to happen? People began to say, I feel like this. I want this. And as people begin to break free from truth, we see where that leads. It leads to bondage. It leads to death. That's what God warned Adam and Eve. Be careful. Be careful. Because that tree of knowledge of good and evil will only lead to death. But this thinking, this philosophy has ingrained itself in our culture, in our entertainment, in our academics, and even in our churches as well. It's crept in and it's, and it's expressive individual. It's like, 
I am what I feel, what I want, what I desire. Oh, brothers and sisters, we need the truth of the gospel to set us free from this lie that is destroying us. And so what's the solution? What's the solution? How do we combat these things? Well, the Bible gives us the solution. Aren't you so thankful Jesus came full of grace and truth? The early church, remember, were worshiping in a pagan environment, in an anti-God, anti-Christ environment. And what did they do? Well, we know what the early church did is they worshiped in truth. In the, in the Bible, we have these creeds. And even secular uh, students of the Bible recognize that these creeds predate Paul's writing. So these are, these are early. This means that the churches were um, using these in their worship before they had a Bible <laughs> fully put together. It was being written. Um, and so Paul, as he writes these letters, quotes these creeds that the early church used. I'm going to use one example here uh, from Romans chapter 1, right? The gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets and the holy scriptures regarding his son who is to his earthly life was a descendant of David and who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead. Christ, Jesus Christ our Lord, through him we receive grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith for his name's sake. We don't have time to go through all those things, but Paul is quoting this creed that the early church would have quoted and would have memorized, would have learned in their worship, and then he writes the whole book of Romans explaining that statement. But what he, what, what's he doing? He's, the church is being formed by the truth of who God is and who they are, and that becomes the foundation for their worship and the foundation for their identity in a pagan culture. Now, if you go to the next slide, that's one example. There's at least, uh, there's many, I think I've quoted like four there, but there's at least uh, probably 10 different creeds written in Paul's writing and Peter's writing that the early church would have quoted. And so Paul quotes them, reminding the church of what they are, their truth that they're standing on in their worship, in their identity, in their understanding of who God is in the gospel. Now, all of those scriptures, we don't have time to read them all. I encourage you to go read them. Sometime, can you leave that up? You can write those down and read those. All of them talk about the gospel. All of them talk about the gospel. Because the gospel is God's truth to form us. <laughs> so it's not just a, something to memorize or a paper to have. It's something to infuse and to shape us kind of like that form around the watermelon that holds it into place, that allows it to grow into its shape. And it's the gospel that holds us and forms us and shapes us so that we can live as God's people in the world, <laughs> in the world. And so it's, it's missional. That's why Paul in Romans says it, it, we're shaped and we're formed by the gospel for this purpose to bring about the message of Jesus, the message of freedom, a message of deliverance, the message of grace, of forgiveness, of hope to a world drowning in its sin. And so as brothers and sisters, as people of God, we find our unity in the gospel. Uh, we're going to skip the, the next slide of the it's the Apostles' Creed. And, and so what I, what I want you to see is there's a progression historically of Christians in the early church. And as they got the Bible, they began to form creeds. And these were statements of truth that they would memorize and hold on to that would shape them and form them in understanding who God is and who they are in the world. And so we know the Apostles' Creed. And then it became the Nicene Creed. And there were, there were dozens and dozens of creeds formed. But they all basically said the same thing, rooted in the gospel. Now, at Rimrock Church, we have a creed. We have a statement of faith. And I'm going to read through this with you guys this morning before we take communion. Because I want you guys, and I want me, to be reminded of the truth that forms us. And this isn't just to be a document. This is, this is the foundation of our unity and our teaching 
and our understanding of who we are in the world. Could you go to the first screen? And would you read these with me out loud this morning? Let's read together. We believe in one God, creator of all things, holy, infinitely perfect, and eternally existing in a loving unity of three equally divine persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Having limitless knowledge and sovereign power, God has graciously purposed from eternity to redeem a people for himself and to make all things new for his glory. Let's go on to the next one. We believe that God has spoken in the scriptures, both Old and New Testaments, through the words of human authors as the verbally inspired word of God. The Bible is without error in the original writings, the complete revelation of his will for salvation, and the ultimate authority by which every realm of human knowledge and endeavor should be judged. Therefore, it is to be believed in all that it teaches and obeyed in all that it requires and trusted in all that it promises. The next one. The, we believe that God created Adam and Eve in his image, but they sin when tempted by Satan. In union with Adam, human beings are sinners by nature and by choice, alienated from God and under his wrath. Only through God's saving work in Jesus Christ can we be rescued, reconciled, and renewed. We believe that Jesus Christ is God incarnate, fully God and fully man, one person in two natures, Jesus, Israel's promised Messiah, was conceived through the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He lived a sinless life, was crucified under Pontius Pilate, arose bodily from the dead, ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father as our high priest and advocate. We believe that Jesus Christ is our representative and substitute, shed his blood on the cross as the perfect, all-sufficient sacrifice for our sins. His atoning death and victorious resurrection constitute the only grounds for salvation. We believe that the Holy Spirit in all he does glorifies the Lord Jesus Christ. He convicts the world of its guilt he regenerates sinners, and in him they are baptized into union with Christ and adopted as heirs in the family of God. He also indwells, illuminates, guides, equips, and empowers believers for Christ-like living and service. We believe that the true church compromises all those who have been justified by God's grace through faith alone in Christ alone, they are united by the Holy Spirit in the body of Christ, of which he is the head. The true church is manifest in local churches whose membership should be composed only of believers. The Lord Jesus mandated two ordinances, baptism and the Lord's Supper, which visibly and tangibly express the gospel. Though they are not the means of salvation, when celebrated by the church in genuine faith, these ordinances confirm and nourish the believer. We believe that God's justifying grace must not be separated from his sanctifying power and purpose. God commands us to love him supremely and others sacrificially, to live out our faith with care for one another, compassion towards the poor, justice for the press. With God's word, the Spirit's power, and fervent prayer in Christ's name, we are to combat the spiritual forces of evil in obedience to Christ's commission. We are to make disciples among all people, always bearing witness to the gospel in word and deed. We believe in the personal, bodily, glorious return of our Lord Jesus Christ. The coming of Christ at a time known only to God demands constant expectancy, and as our blessed hope motivates the believer to godly living, sacrificial service, and energetic mission. 
We believe that God commands everyone, everywhere to believe the gospel by turning to him in repentance and receiving the Lord Jesus Christ. We believe that God will raise the dead bodily and judge the world, assigning the unbeliever to condemnation and eternal conscious punishment and the believer to eternal blessedness and joy with the Lord in the new heaven and the new earth to the praise of his glorious grace. Amen.